What's up, dudes? I am so pumped to be back with you for another Saturday sermon. Today, we are hanging out in my study, okay? It looks a little bit differently. I got some books hanging out over there. It's the perfect Zoom background, and I'm super excited about today's message. It's called Get or Grind. I think it's going to be so much fun to be able to, to read this with you, be able to study this with you. A couple things I need you to keep in mind. June 7th is our first Sunday back at Mount Perrin. But listen up, we are not going to have few services until further notice. We're all going to be gathering and worshiping together in the main sanctuary. So if you come through on June 7th, there will be no few services. We'll be worshiping together in the main sanctuary. And so today, if you have your Bible, turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 10 through 20. We're going to be reading 10 verses today. So if you have not got your Bible reading done, we're going to knock it out right now. So uh, Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 10 through 20 says this, When you have eaten, this is God talking to Israel after he brought them out of Egyptian slavery and he's preparing them for the promised land, preparing them for the place where they're going to build their homes, build their families, and they're going to worship God with freedom without having to live in bondage. And so what God is kind of preparing Israel for is like, hey, listen, don't forget about me when you start winning. Don't forget about me when things start going well. And so if they do these things, they'll be able to sustain the gifts, the blessing of God. So verse 10 says this, when you have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commandments, his laws and his decrees that I am giving you this day. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied and when you build fine houses and settle down and when your herds and flocks grow large and your silver and gold increase, all you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God who has brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Verse 15. He led you through the vast and dreadful wilderness, that thirsty and waterless land with its venomous snakes and scorpions. He brought you water out of a hard rock. So now Moses is declaring all the amazing miracles that God has done. Hey, he brought you out of slavery. He has brought water out of rocks. He's been able to protect you in this season. Verse 16 says, he gave you manna to eat in the wilderness, something your ancestors had never known, to humble and test you so that in the end, it might go well with you. You may say to yourself, my power and strength of my hand have produced this wealth for me, right? Verse 18, but remember the Lord, your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your ancestors as is, as it is today. If you ever forget the Lord your God and follow other gods and worship and bow down to them, I testify against you today that you will surely be destroyed. Like the nations the Lord has destroyed before you, so will you be destroyed for not obeying the laws of your God. Yo, this is such an incredible passage of scripture. It was 10 verses, so it's a lot of content to consume. But but here are a few things that I want you to be taking in as you are hearing this number one, right? God is saying, yo, listen, once you get into your own land, once you're able to farm, once you're able to mine for gold, once you're able to buy property that no one else can take from you, right? What I want you to remember is that you never graduate from manna. You never graduate from me providing for you. So even if you are the best farmer in the world, if you're the best shepherd in the world, if you're the best herdsman in the world, if you're the best miner, you're the best business mind in the world, listen, it is I who gives you the ability to gain wealth. All of us have experienced a level of giftedness that produces success. Some of you guys are incredible athletes. You're amazing soccer players. You're amazing basketball players. You're amazing tennis stars, right? And and all of those things, I am not saying you did not earn your spot on that travel team. I'm not saying you, not, you did not earn your rankings nationally. I'm not saying you didn't earn those things. But I don't want you to forget it is only through God's goodness that you have your athleticism. It's only through God's goodness that you were able to recover from your injuries. It's only through God's goodness that you were able to have strength in your legs. It is only through God's goodness. And the reason that I know that, right, is you look at someone like Chris Bosch, who was 
an incredible basketball player, a once in a generation talent. And in the middle of his basketball career, he finds out he has a heart condition that makes him basically retire. Or you look at Sharif O'Neal, who is an incredible basketball player, this, one of the oldest, son, if not the, actually the second oldest son of um, Shaquille O'Neal, nationally ranked basketball player, gets a full ride scholarship to UCLA, and he finds out he has a heart condition, has to get surgery, sits out for a year of basketball, and now he gets to play again at LSU. Yo, listen, we never graduate from needing the goodness and the mercy and the consistency of God. Doesn't mean that God causes these bad things to happen, no. But what it should produce in us is a gratitude, recognizing that everything that we have is a gift from God. And it's not guaranteed, right? If anything that this season has taught us as we're kind of, as things are starting to open back up and things are starting to go back to normal, is that nothing in this life is guaranteed. It doesn't matter how good of a basketball player you have been. Right. If all the basketball courts are closed and they're not having travel ball, it really doesn't matter. So we as believers, we recognize we never graduate from manna. A second thing that this, that this passage may be teaching us, right, is that obedience always produces blessing. Obedience always produces blessing. If we honor God with our lives, if we honor God with our with our talents and all these things, there's a blessing that follows along with it. So much of the Old Testament shows that blessing is attached to behavior. If you obey my word, then I'll protect you. If you are if you are kind and generous, you will receive that back. All of that stuff happens in the Old Testament. And, and we begin to have this mindset that, yo, if I am blessed, if I have the good life, it has to be because I have walked in obedience. So the question that, that we have to ask ourselves, right? Do I deserve every good thing that I have? Because the way that you answer that one question will determine the life that you live, the person that you become, and the way you experience the things that you have. Do I deserve it? Is, 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 is the protection, the wealth, the blessing, is everything that I have, is it because I deserve it? I, I think for me, what I'm starting to realize is that no one can answer that question for me. No one can answer that, that question honestly for me, that do I believe that I deserve every single good thing that I have? Only I know whether I honestly believe that. Because what begins to happen for me is I look at other people that are good people, people that are great people, and seeing how their lives played out. I look at the Apostle Peter or the Apostle John or Thomas and seeing how their stories ended, how they, how John, they tried to kill him multiple times to the point where they just put him on a prison island away from other people. Or Peter, they hung him upside down. Or, or Thomas, who ended up dying for the gospel of Jesus. And their obedience ended in death. So why does my obedience end in provision? Why does my obedience end in me living with an amazing roommate and having great, great friends? Why does my obedience, why does my blessing look different than their blessing? God, what makes me special? What makes me different? I think the answer to this question is actually found in John chapter 16. This is where Jesus is talking to his disciples and it's such a pivotal and important verse. And it says this, Jesus says this, I have told you these things. I've told you these things so that in this, so I've told you these things so that in me, you may have peace in this world. You'll have trouble, but take heart for I have overcome the world. I think we have to begin to redefine what blessing means. I, I think that blessing does include financial, financial blessings being able to do what you want when you want, being able to spend money the way you want to. I think that blessing also equals success, the, the ability to, to be good at what you do. Blessing also includes protection, being able to live in a place where you feel safe and comfortable. But Jesus says that in this world, we will have trouble. We will have challenges. But take heart, for I have overcome the world. When we begin to understand that the blessing of God does not always equal having safety, having the things that we want will begin to happen, it's three very simple things. Number one, 
will begin to live God-centered lives. The blessing of God is the presence of God. It is a friendship with him. It is having a connection with him that, that surpasses all understanding. Number two, we begin to be more grateful. When I look at Peter, who when he preached the gospel for the very first time on the day of Pentecost, and thousands of people came to know who Jesus was, and, and there began the explosion of the church. But his life ended in him watching his wife get crucified and him being crucified. I begin to be more grateful that me following Jesus in 2020 looks like him providing for me. Looks like me having a healthy family and, and having healthy friends and, and all of the good things that I have is not because I deserve them more than Peter did or I deserve my life more than MLK did or I deserve my life more than Malcolm X did. No, no, no. I can really just say, God, thank you for what you've given me. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for what you have done. The third thing that begins to happen when we begin to realize that, yo, our life with Jesus is not always guaranteed blessing that is defined the way that other people may define it. It does not mean success the way that other people may de define it. it. It produces generosity. I can be generous with what I have because I know that what I have was given to me. I think it's interesting that Moses tells the children of Israel that it is God that gives them the ability to gain wealth. It is God's gift, not just your grind, that allows you to have more than what you need. And so because I realize that God's gift is what gives me the ability to have more than what I need, I can be more generous with my time. I can be more generous with my talents. I can be more generous with my finances because I know that all of this is not something that I just produce by hard work. And God, God loves people that work hard. In Colossians, he says, hey, do everything as if you're working directly for me. Do it in excellence. Do it well, right? But he also wants us to be generous. And the way that we recognize and are able to be generous is by knowing that everything I have is a gift. And I can share that gift with other people. So do I believe that God is good? Yes. Does this good God guarantee challenges for us? Yes. So my response is to live a life that is God-centered. My response is to live a life that is grateful. My response is to live a life that is generous. And when I do those things, what begins to happen is a hope, joy, love, peace, and the ability to experience all that God has for me to sustain, to live in the promises of God, no matter what my circumstances say. And as a result of that, we can live a life that is God-centered. We can live a life full of gratitude, and we can live a life of generosity. Love you guys. I cannot wait to see you on Monday for our next Instagram Live. Love you guys. Bye.